Hello everyone, uh, excellent to see so many of you in the audience today. I'm Anendo, program curator at Slush, and it's my absolute pleasure to be joined here with Justin on stage, so thanks so much for being here. Yeah, that was awesome. I love that I came out to lasers. Yeah, all right, you can give yourselves let's, let's, a round of applause let's, let's for being here. Applause. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so Justin, most people know you as the co-founder of Twitch, also the co-founder of Stash. Maybe you could start off by telling us something that people might not know about you. First time. Well, I think they announced it beforehand, but I'm also an amateur DJ. And in exchange for doing this speaking slot, I made them give me a DJ slot. So please come tonight. <laughs> well, That sounds a little desperate, but uh, it's going to be great. I'm great. Uh, Justin's underplaying himself. He's a, he has a chart-topping hit. So, uh, but let's get to the entrepreneurial side of things, Justin. Maybe you could just kick us off by telling us when you started building your first company and how many companies you've built so far? Uh, well, I started off like 20 years ago, in 2004 actually, as I started my first company, which was a uh, online calendar company, kind of like Google Calendar, except worse in every way. <laughs> and uh, we started off when we were college kids in 20, 2024. I was still a senior in undergrad. And then the only good part about that company was I uh, got admitted into Y Combinator, and that's kind of how I started my entrepreneurial journey uh, 20 years ago. And then since then, I've started, I actually have lost count, but I think probably over 10 companies. I see. Some of them were like successful, and some were fiery holes in the ground. Well, well that's, that's, I guess, a part of the experience, and given this sort of vast amount of experience over a decade plus of founding companies, is there like one piece of advice you would have for all the early stage founders in the audience today? I mean, it's kind of trite, but I think they need to like focus on their customers, right? If you're an early stage founder, you should focus on talking to your, talking to your customers, learning from your customers, and probably doing more of that and less of like attending conferences. Uh, well, we have exits to many <laughs> directions, so you can, you can find your way out, but... <laughs> There's no early stage founders in the crowd. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, uh, maybe in a more sort of, maybe in a serious note then, but was it, just to elaborate on that, was it clear to you early on, let's, let's say when you're starting Twitch, that you needed to focus on customers or was it more so like something you had to learn slowly but surely? I mean, it sounds like something we should have known, but like, no, we actually had to learn that. Um, like when we started Twitch, the company was actually this company called Justin TV. And it kind of came from this idea of like streaming my life to the internet 24 seven. This was before there was Instagram Live or anything like that. So, it wasn't really social media at the time. This is like kind of right when social media was being invented. Mm -hmm. And so we had this idea. I would say it was like more of an idea than a business. And we, I think, accidentally tapped into something that people wanted, which was tapping into my own desire at the time to be famous and like put myself out there on the internet. Um, but then we like never really talked to any customers. So we launched this as a plat, you know, we launched my stream, turned out to be a, we, we opened it up as a platform for anyone to broadcast anything that they wanted. And so it kind of became like YouTube Live. Um, but then we stopped talking to anybody who was our actual user for several years and instead built a bunch of features that nobody wanted and kind of stagnated a little bit. And then eventually we relearned the lesson of talking to our customers because you know, after quite a while of stagnation, we were like, hey, we need to do something different. And my co-founder Emmett was like, hey, let's focus on the gaming streams. There was like nascent numbers of users who were streaming video game content to the site. This was back in like 2010. And um, so we decided to focus on what they wanted and that kind of, um, we started talking to them again and understanding what they wanted out of a streaming platform. And it turns out they wanted a couple things. They wanted uh, to make money. They wanted more fans, basically more love, and they wanted to be able to make money doing what they love. And so when we started focusing on those, providing them those things, that's when it really started taking off. I see. And there's so much there. I just want to double down on a couple of things. Firstly, you, spent, you said that you spent many years sort of finding your customer, right? And there's this mantra in the startup space, like, okay, if you don't have this crazy traction within six months, within a year, maybe it's time to pivot. Like, where do you stand on that? What's, what, how should founders think about whether to pivot or to go, go all ahead into kind of like keeping at the same thing and discovering it further? 
Well, I think people pivot when they run out of ideas on like what to do to make their company grow. Mm -hmm. And so often it's best if you have a strong vision in your mind of what the customers need, probably because you, one, talk to customers, but number two is like maybe you were your own customer, you know? And so I think it's often, like in the beginning with Twitch, at the you know, very least, Emmett was like a big consumer of the gaming stream, so was I, and so we had some ideas of like what that might look like, you know? And so that helped us in that, in that beginning. So I think it's, you know, that's why like oftentimes it's best if you are building something from your own experience, you know? I think a lot of people get into trouble when they like, they want to build a company, but they just want to build any idea they're not really building an idea from their own need or their own experience of someone having that need. Mm -hmm. And then they just build something that they think will make money or be successful. But, you know, maybe it turns out it's like they don't really have the depth of knowledge of what exactly is needed in that market. I see. So you were a streamer and you sort of used that experience to initially found your customers. It was the streamer and you built a product they love, right? But I just want to talk, think about, talk about like the product market fit side of things, right? Was it a moment when you realized this is what streamers want? we're going to build this product and it sort of took off? Or was it more so of like a, a kind of an iterative process by which maybe you found product market fit, but then you needed to refine it? Maybe you lost it a little bit at times. So was it sort of a moment versus sort of a gradient of time? Yeah, it was more of a gradient versus like a light switch or something that you just turn on and off, right? Like for us, you know, we had this very nascent, when we started working on Twitch, we had this very nascent set of people who were streaming um, live you know video games and people who are watching them it was only like three percent of the traffic on the site at the time and so you know there's hundreds of thousands of people who are watching in the audience right so it's pretty small compared to twitch today which is you know hundreds of millions of, of audience people in the audience and so we had this kind of nascent feeling that people wanted this but it wasn't like it was exploding or anything and then when we started understanding what are the features that those people want, how do we deliver them those features, like as we rolled more and more of those things out, you know, the growth got better. And it wasn't ever like a clean, you know, monotonically increasing thing. It was like there'd be an event and then people would come for that and then, you know, go down again and then there'd be another like event on another weekend and it would go up and then, you know, it kind of went up and down in like a fits and spurts. All right, so you had the ups and downs, but overall it was an up. Uh, but on the growth point, as far as I understand, you're not the first mover in the market, right? You had a competitor to a certain extent. And how did you kind of beat out the competition? And what kind of advice would you have for founders in the audience who are also not the first movers in the market, second or third movers? Like, how should they go about being the best and winning the category? Yeah, so first when we started the company, there were other streaming companies like Ustream and Livestream that were offering general streaming. And then there was also someone who was like doing, focused really on gaming streaming called Own3D. And then eventually later there was like Google and Facebook, you know, had gaming streaming on their, you know, they were really focused on gaming streaming. And I think they poured like almost a billion dollars into paying streamers uh, to join their platforms. So, you know, there's quite a lot of competition throughout the history of the company. And I, I think what we did best was we just really focused on delivering, well, first of all, we identified who our customer was. And so we said in the very beginning, and this all goes to my co-founder, M.A., who gets all the credit, he was like, the, game, the, com the customer is the gaming streamer. So if we just make a really good platform for streamers, then everybody else will follow. You know? And so like, the audience members will come. Like, they'll come to whatever platform. Even if it's like, kind of a shittier platform for the audience, it'll be like they'll come to watch the content. The content's a differentiator. And so we decided to focus on uh, the streamer, and we just, like I was saying, we focused on like, what are those things that they want, and how do we deliver them a better and better experience? And, um, we focused on being like really authentic with them. So like other people would come in and say, oh, we'll pay you, you know, something that we knew was unsustainable and they wouldn't really be able to deliver on the long term. And we would always be like honest about like, here's what we can pay, but we're like gonna try to make it really good for streamers. And if we just kind of built a consistent reputation of being like really there for the customer. And I think that really worked and helped us in the long term, you know, reputationally with the content creators. I see, so it's sort of like just never, putting your customer in the second spot, right? Yeah, it's like good. relentlessly focusing on delivering for the customer. And I think, you know, you want to pay attention to what your competition is doing just to understand what they're delivering for the customer. But I think if you get, you know, you can't get too caught up in like the competition. There's going to be competition in every market. Like you're going to win if you, you know, you're going to build something great if you deliver for your customer. I see. So you guys clearly did that, right? Yeah. So you guys did that, scaled it, had an incredible exit. Life is good, right? After that, I think 
you started a company called Atrium, which I believe was a legal services platform for startups. Initially had a lot of traction, 70 million plus raised in funding, but then you got into some sort of troubles there, right? Maybe you could just talk the audience through what were some like key learnings in that experience for you. Well, that's an example of like one of the ones that was a fiery hole in the ground. So I started this company, it was a legal technology company. I thought it was a good business and it wasn't really a passion of mine. It was more like, I think this is a good business. At the time I was really caught up in like, let me just build something that I think is gonna be successful and make a lot of money. And uh, I don't think, I mean, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, I don't think choosing things based on like a mercenary perspective is particularly useful. And so, you know, at the time I like, we built this company, it was, and, but at the end of the day, we were like, not focused enough on like delivering, I think, value for a specific customer. And that would be an example of like not where we, where we didn't figure it out, you know, and because we, we weren't focused relentlessly on delivering value for one specific customer base. I think we went way too broad with the customer segment we were targeting. And so, um, you know, that, those are probably the main lessons that I would draw from it, you know? Okay. Like you should do something you give a shit about and you should focus on delivering for your customer. I see. So. There's, the equation has now two parts, right? Oh. And that was your, sort of your key learning in your second time around, right? Yeah, I guess I unlearned it from the first time. I see. So it was, again, sort of now that you're building Stash, yeah. What's, yeah. what's different this time around? So you had that experience. You had, obviously, Twitch. What's different now? Yeah, so I have a new company. It's yeah. called Stash. We're a platform for gaming studios. Uh, so you know, gaming studios now, if, especially for mobile games, uh, they monetize their customers uh, by selling them things, in-game purchases. Um, but if you sell them inside of the, uh, you know, your apps in like Google Play Store or, or the Apple App Store, you end up paying a pretty large percentage of revenue to those platforms. And so a lot of times these game companies want to directly connect with their player bases uh, through their own website uh, where they can monetize them directly, but then they can also provide them all these different services and you know, value-added services on top of that. So things like... Um, leaderboards and uh, matchmaking and um, loyalty programs, and, you know, other content. And so we're kind of like the website builder for these uh, uh, experiences for game studios to um, build a completely custom website for their, uh, for their, player, um, their player base. <laughs> we also have a launcher that enables them to like help their customers directly launch the games. Uh, so this time, you know, we went back to that Twitch formula and it's like, how do we who's our customer, here are the customers of the game studio, and we're like, how do we relentlessly deliver for the customer? How do we obsessively focus on the customer, what their needs are, what they want, and how do we figure out how to give them that and just iterate, create that iterative loop where we're just like focused on the customer. Um, and so that's, that's what we've been doing. I see. And this all sounds awesome, but let me play devil's advocate here. So when you started Twitch, you were your own customer, right? Streaming your life 24-7. I suppose you are not a, you, I, I don't know if you've built a game studio before, but I don't think so at least. No, I haven't like, built a game studio before, yeah. So how do, how do you actually know that you're a customer this time around? Yeah, so I mean, uh, one, one, we've hired a bunch of people from game studios and who have experience uh, in, at game studios, investing in game studios, et cetera. Uh, the other thing is like, we just talk to our customers a lot. You know, that's one of the reasons I came to Finland. There's a lot of mobile game studios here, as probably everyone knows. And so uh, just, rel you know, being in the conversation with your, our customers a lot and having that, you know, off, you know, regular communication. We have regular, like with our customers that we do have, we have regular meetings every week or two with them to understand like what their needs are, how we're delivering for them. Um, you know, it's not rocket science. You just have to go and talk to them. I see. And I think based on your three experiences so far, or big ones at least, uh, where do you stand on this whole debate about like first time founders, focus on product and second time founders on distribution. Like where do you stand on that sort of? So I think I said that, I like tweeted it and people really like that, that yeah. first time founders focus on product, yeah. second time founders focus on distribution. But I actually recant that tweet in that I think you need to focus on product the whole, you know, it's like you should just focus on product. All right. I, like you can't be successful without a good product at some point. Like I think there's a lot of companies that are successful today and you'd be like, oh, their product sucks. But the product at one point was probably really good. I see. And, and I they've just been riding on that, coasting on that for like 20 years. Well, I, I want to ask one thing, which is like in relation to this sort of like maniacal focus on customer and product, right? In an early stage startup, how do you then motivate other teams, right? There's other teams than product teams. There's sales, distribution, marketing, whatnot, right? How do, how do you motivate those teams that you need to just focus on the product for now? 
or like how do you go about building that sort of company culture? Well, I mean, I think you need to. I mean, that's a, it's hard. Where like you have a bunch of different departments, like there's probably some things that are more relatively important than others. I think you have to communicate like an overall vision for the company and what you're trying to deliver for your customer. Hopefully, that's something that's primarily enabled by the product, and then explain how each of these different departments fits into that, right? So, like, if you're sales or mark, you know, if you're marketing, you're like communicating what the product values are to the customer segment, right? If you're sales, you're helping navigate the buying journey for the customer of that product, right? Like, so, you know, everyone has a, a role to play. And you know, did you now that you know that product is the sort of focus? It still feels like this company is a bit different than, say, like Twitch, right? I think once you've talked about this idea of like market versus execution risk, where like some some companies have more market risk, some companies have more execution risk. Maybe you could just like e explain that concept a little bit to our audience, and how you think about now building companies versus before. Well, so yeah, Twitch Twitch is like a market risk company, right? Where we were building something completely new, like a new user behavior for consumers. Out there, and we like, we didn't know if it was going to work. You know, both Justin TV and then Twitch. It was kind of a hypothesis, um, and so there was is primarily market risk, which I think it's easier to take that kind of risk when you're young. You know, you're willing to just kind of like roll the dice on like some YOLO. Now, like with Stash, Stash is more of a market risk, or sorry, an execution risk company where like there are incumbents in the market. There's other people doing what we're doing. I, it's pretty clear that people. Want to monetize? You know, game companies want to sell things to their player bases, and so it's much more the execution of can we deliver like a really excellent product and experience for our customers, and for them to deliver to their players. Um, so you know, it's a it's 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 a little bit of a different risk in the company, but um, you know, it's probably more reflective of where I'm at in my career. I see. I mean, I think that's awesome advice for the for the founders in general, and. I just want to ask one more follow-on there, which is that: Do you think then first-time founders, who maybe have less traditional experience, industry experience, should try to kind of game this, game their advantages, which is take this sort of market risk? And if you're more experienced, maybe execution risk is a lot easier then. I don't know if there's a hard and fast rule. You know, you should just uh, build the company you want to build and take the risk that you want to want to take. You know, yeah. All right. I guess it's uh, everyone for themselves then. Exactly. Everyone makes their best decision. FFA. Well, we've we've meditated quite a bit now on product and for on customer, and I just want to ask a few other questions, maybe about things that you've talked about quite a bit, right? right? So we've had the equation, which is give a crap about what you're doing, and secondly, you know, build a product that your that your customers love. Um, I just want to focus on that first point a little bit more, which is that how important do you think is it to actually love what you do as a founder, and how e easy is it to kind of get lost? In that idea that I actually like what I do, but maybe I, maybe they actually don't, you know. Well, when when people ask me about that, like you know, passion or loving what they do, oftentimes I think they're thinking about um, like there's the space they're working in, you know. So they have like a when they say they want to work on something they're passionate about, they'll say like I want to work on video games or something like because they like video games or healthcare because they want to change healthcare or, or change the world or you know. But I, I really think about it now as like what are the actions. Every day that you like doing, you know. So, as an example, I like storytelling. I love uh, the you know telling people about some new idea, and uh, and I like coaching. I love like mentoring people. And so, for me, it's like if I can do those activities in my day today, then like I feel like I've had a great day, no matter what the result of that was. Like if I worked on those things, and then like everything I worked on. Was irrelevant. Like the tomorrow, like all these companies went went out of business or something. Would I feel like I wasted my time? And you know, if I did the things I love doing, then I feel like the answer is no. And so for me, it's like storytelling, and that manifests itself as like fundraising or recruiting, um, you know, selling customers. Those are all forms of storytelling or coaching. You know, so for me, I'm like coaching the other executive team members in in my company. Um, those are things that I really love to do. And so I just try to spend every day doing things that I love to do. And Work with people who compliment me on like they're really good at and love doing the parts that I'm maybe not as strong at. I see. Well, um, I, I just want to also ask if founders have sort of this sort of holistic interest, right? They obviously have the company, but maybe they have something else they're also passionate about. For example, you're passionate about coaching people, 
obviously you also are passionate in the arts. Do you think that's possible to do while you're building a company? And how may sort of founders be able to find that balance in general? Well, I think it, you know, it might be hard to get to 100%, right? Where you're like, oh, I'm only going to do things that I like, love to do, that I'm great at. That might be impossible because if you're starting a company, sometimes you're resource constrained. It's hard to do only, you know, you have to do some things you don't like. I think the, the key is to like continually try to prune the things you're doing and give other people, you know, build a team around you that can do the things that you're not as excited about um, over time as you grow your company. Because I know so many friends of mine are founders of companies that are pretty big companies. You know, they're worth hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars. And they feel like they're trapped doing a set of things that they're good at. They're in their zone of competence, right? The things that they're good at but take energy from them. Instead of being in their zone of genius, which are the things they're good at and give them energy. And so I always encourage people to constantly evaluate what are the things they're doing and see, like, can I be giving some of these things that take energy away from me to the people around me? I guess that's a maxim for everyone in the audience, zone of competence versus zone of genius yeah. and whatnot. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about sort of taking a step back, right? And it relates to the sort of holistic focus, which is that obviously building a company is a very, very intense process. It can be hectic and you can get very carried away with everything that's external, right? How important is it to sort of take a step back whether that be long-term things or short-term things. For example, an extreme example is, for example, the founders of Notion. I believe they moved all the way to Japan to focus on their product and just find some peace. How do you go about doing that, and is that important to you? Yeah, I think it's always important to be able to break your context and get periods of focus or like to you know, change your context so you can think about things in a new way. So you know, over the years, I learned a lot of things that work for me. You know? So I've... Um, like, work exercise is one, you know, when I'm like stressed out about something or like whatever, I'll like exercise or just go for a walk. You know, I know like going for a walk in the middle of the day is like something that often helps me just like think about things in a new perspective or actually, to be honest, I've thought of like lots of great ideas for companies while I'm like on a meditation retreat, which is, I'm probably supposed to be meditating, but I'll just like think, be thinking about random shit. And then I'll think of like some idea for a company, you know? And so I don't know, I think finding whatever ways there are for you to break your context is super important and like regularly interspersing those into your life is valuable. Is that something you do more nowadays as opposed to say when you're younger and just starting off breaking context? Yeah, when I was context? starting off I had like a very scarcity, scarcity mindset where I was like, holy shit, I need to work every hour otherwise I'm gonna fail and die. You know, so I was like, I felt like I was, tr you know, drowning all the time. But that's not really true, right? Like, probably 90% of my work was wasted when I was young because I worked super hard, but I wasn't like working smart. Right. And so now I think giving myself a little bit of breathing room for perspective is always, you know, it's like a better way to live. I see. And I suppose the decision quality is also improved with that, right? I hope so. <laughs> I, guess, I suppose you're being a little humble there. Oh. But I think there's one final point I'd like to touch upon, and it's related to this connection point. Um, we obviously have a lot of founders here today, and one thing we hear from founders is that at times while you're building a company, there's this sense of loneliness. You feel like there's no one you can talk to, and also the sort of startup and venture landscape can be transactional at times, right? How can sort of an early stage young founder go about navigating this challenge and m make these sort of meaningful connections? Well, I think it's really good to have a collection of peers who are at a similar stage in life or in their company's lives uh, to you, where you can be really honest um, with them about what's going on. And so, um, you know, like Y Combinator is a great place to meet people like that, where you, you know, you are in a batch, in a group with like people who are going through the founder journey alongside you. That's where I met a lot of my early mm -hmm. cohort of people um, who ended up turning out to, you know, go on to do really great things. And, um, but there's like other, programs, right, and other places to meet, meet people like that, or like I'm part of this organization called YPO, which is kind of like a similar thing for CEOs. So I think just finding a cohort and like meeting regularly is like a really valuable experience, or even just having people who are at the same stage of, or like one step ahead of you where you can learn from them, you know, and just cultivating that relationship explicitly is super valuable. And I, I just want to ask one follow on to that. We had Emmett, your co-founder at Twitch, talk here a few years back, and I think you mentioned that you guys had sort of, uh, you guys were quite hectic in terms of your sort of co-founder relationships yeah. earlier on when you were building Twitch. 
Has, has, has your approach to co-founder relationships changed now that you're building a new company and over time? And well, I think I'm a much better communication, communicator now than I was before. Or I don't think, I am. So before it felt like I felt like something was not working with my co-founder or there's friction, I wouldn't really be able to communicate in a non-violent way like my feedback and feelings. Right. And I've worked on that a lot and being able to communicate clearly without it being an attack on the other person or being, them, them perceiving it as an attack has been you know, tremendously different for like, improving my working relationships with the people around me. So I would say like, it has changed substantially because of that. I think investing in communication is always a good idea. Well, I think that's a piece of advice about communication we can all take home about customers. And you've talked about so much today, Justin. I think we're out of time. It's been an absolute pleasure interviewing here, you here today. And uh, thanks so much for doing this. It's been my honor. All right. Boom. Thank you.